next song is when the music fades Friends, may I request all of you to kindly mute your mics. Kindly mute your mics as we begin our second session. As we begin our second session, may I request you to kindly mute your mics. Shall we look to God in prayer before we begin our second session? Father Lord, above God, gracious Lord, we thy people continue to glorify thy holy name for the word that you have given to us. 
we once again surrender ourselves into thy holy presence as we will be receiving thy holy and precious word from thy servant, from thy son, Mr. L.T. Jaychandran. All of us would like to place ourselves before you and our devices, our technology. Your grace, your mighty hand be upon all of us. We bless thy holy name and we ask this prayer in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Sir, may I invite you once again to kindly lead us into the session number two. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, as I said in the, uh, during the service sermon, Sir, uh, we are going to low. Uh, you're not able to hear me? Yeah, it's okay now. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as I said at the, during the sermon, uh, we are going to look at uh, John chapter 13. Uh, we look at the first three verses. Uh, we did not uh, do that. And I told you that there are four prerequisites, so to speak. Uh, four requirements for us to be able to uh, wash one another's feet. And the first one is the first part of verse 1. It was just before the Passover fe festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, again, one of the characteristics of John's gospel is uh, his reference to the hour. He always talks about it. For example, if you remember in John chapter 2, uh, at the uh, wedding in Cana of Galilee, uh, when uh, they were running out of wine, uh, he comes to Jesus, uh, Mary comes to Jesus, Mary the mother of Jesus, and what does the Lord say to her? My hour has not yet come. Now I want to tell you this, this is very interesting. I don't want us to draw the wrong conclusion that Jesus had a kind of a rigid timetable and he went about doing that. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, I think uh, if you are familiar with Oswald Chambers and his collection of daily writings, daily readings, compiled by his uh, wife, because he did not write anything when he died rather suddenly in Cairo when he was 40 years old. Um, uh, Chambers says, Jesus was neither cold-blooded nor impulsive. Now, what do we mean by that? Cold-blooded means you have your timetable so rigidly fixed that you cannot give anybody uh, allowance, no time for anyone else. If I went to Jesus, so he would say, go to my secretary. She may give you time next Tuesday afternoon or something like that. Nor was he impulsive, running from here to there. You know, one of the things you discover when you read the Gospels, particularly Mark's Gospel, is Jesus was busy, but never in a hurry. You know, that kind of an attitude comes by being sensitive to the leading of God. That's what I understand by the coming of an hour. Jesus knew intuitively that this was the time. And this was the last evening I was going to spend with his disciples before his crucifixion. And so... Uh, he is conscious of that. What I'm trying to say is that in order to, going back to what I shared in the first session, the sermon, for us to be able to be willing to wash somebody else's feet and also to be willing to let somebody wash our feet, we have to have that sensitivity that if somebody, particularly our spouses, when they correct us, uh, very often we husbands particularly, I don't know, uh, I can't speak on behalf of the wives because I'm a husband, not a wife. So uh, I know that uh, when they correct us, very often we react, we defend ourselves. And what I have come to learn over many years is to listen to them, whether they correct us with the right attitude or with the wrong attitude to be willing to receive correction from one another, and particularly from the ones who are closest to us. 
In fact, uh, I wanted to take you back to what we saw in the first session. Uh, when Jesus said, uh, and when I made this, draw, drew this conclusion, love in the church precedes love of the church. Just as love in God, love in the Trinity, precedes the love of God for us. John 17, 24 precedes John 3, 16. In the same way, love in the church is shown by our sensitivity to one another. Uh, you know, our daughter was married in January uh, 97. Uh, this was in Mumbai. And the pastor who spoke at her wedding said something like this. She, he said, some of us find it easier to love our enemies than to love our wives. And of course, we all laughed. Uh, but then we realized, and I'm realizing as I'm sharing the word with you, loving the lost is easier than loving the saved. Because the lost are conveniently far away. So it is easier to love them. The saved are inconveniently close by. That is why it is so difficult to love them. So please remember, love in the church overflows as love of the church. Just like love in God overflows as love of God. And that is really the constitution of the church. That is where the church becomes a reflection of the Trinity. We'll see more of that in uh, chapter 17. But I want to tell you, that is what helps you develop the sensitivity to the Spirit of God. For example, when uh, George Mani uh, spoke to me, uh, you should... Uh, be with us for the church retreat and the Sunday service. Uh, I did not have to pray and fast in, uh, before I said yes. I only checked my calendar because in some inward way, I stood committed to you after spending that day with you, the 16th of February. You see, that is how God builds relationships. And so finding God's will becomes a, a very easy thing. In fact, finding God's will is a very bad phrase. It almost gives the impression that God is hiding it and we are finding it. It's a kind of a hide and seek between God and us. Uh, ridiculous. Uh, that, that's not how the Bible puts it. So uh, I want you to understand that sensitivity to God. That's what Jesus had. He knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Secondly, uh, you see the second part of the first verse, having loved his own who were in the world, he now shows them the full extent of his love. Having loved his own. When was that? Three and a half years earlier. If you go to Luke chapter six, uh, Luke is uh, more clear than Mark and Mark chapter three. Uh, obviously, when Jesus began his ministry, many people started following him. But then Jesus spends a whole night in prayer to God, according to Luke. And then out of the many who began to follow him, he chose 12. And he committed himself to those 12 disciples. What I said in the earlier session, I want to repeat. When we are baptizing a new believer uh, in, uh, say, CMC, uh, we are asking that person to give a testimony to Christ, very important. But then you must also help that person to make a commitment to CMC. That's not all. CMC should stand and make a commitment to the new believer. So it's very interesting. It's a mutual commitment between the church and the believer. That means we are telling the new believer that we are going to stand with you through thick and thin and maybe God will lead some of you to walk with those persons. So I want to tell you that that is what we have come to call mentoring, discipling. You know, those words are so technical uh, and immediately we are all organizational people. We immediately put that into slots. It is nothing more than walking with people. In their struggles in life, you walk with them. That's how we build people. I know right there here in CMC, I can even look at somebody here who has walked with some people, younger people, and made them to be future leaders of the church. So I, I want you to recognize that that is part of the commitment. 
that Jesus makes. Okay, now we come to the third prerequisite, which is in verse 2. What do we read? The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray him. Now, the question that I want to put before you for your consideration, did Jesus wash Judas's feet? Of course he did. But I'm going to take you back uh, in their three and a half year journey. And this is a matter of theological discussion. When did Jesus come to know or come to realize that Judas could be a possible betrayer? That he had one wolf among the other 11 sheep, among his disciples, whatever that is. I want to tell you, uh, imagine uh, this kind of a scenario. From the time Jesus realizes that Judas is going to be a betrayer, the, the betrayer, and he starts discriminating against Judas, and the other 11 disciples are watching it. And now on this last day, he washes the feet of everyone, skips Judas, goes to the next person. And the next day, Jesus is betrayed, crucified, their hopes are dashed. And they want to ascribe leadership qualities to Judas as well. In order to betray, to decide to betray Jesus, required a strong person. So I would consider Judas to be as strong a person as Peter was. And you know what could have happened with the death of Jesus? Five disciples would have followed Peter. Five would have followed Judas. And the first church would have split right down the middle. That did not happen. Because he continued to show love to Judas. He washes his feet. He dips uh, the bread along with him, which was a sign of fellowship. Not just a symbol that he was the one who's going to betray him. That was for the other disciples to see. But as far as the custom, the Jewish custom was concerned, it was an expression of love for the other person. And then what do we read in verse 30? You know, John 13 verse 30 is probably the saddest verse in this chapter. Or maybe in the whole Gospels, Judas went out and it was night. So Judas goes out. The other 11 are preserved. You know, those of you who are in the healthcare profession, uh, you call this isolation of the infection. That means you did not allow the infection to spread to the others. You isolated the infection. Judas goes out and it is night. In Proverbs 25, there is a verse which says, if your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. If he's hungry, give him food. By doing this, you will heap coals of fire on his head. What does it mean? You make uh, life unbearable for him that either he comes back to the fellowship or he leaves you for good. You know, in our Methodist discipline, we call that excommunication. Now, excommunication is not simply a bureaucratic decision of the pastorate committee. It is a decision to which the church is forced to come after all the other avenues of restoring that person have failed. Jesus would say in Matthew 18, if your brother is uh, take, overtaken, if you do, to the as no the church is excommunicated. That means you are showing love till the last possible. You are showing love till the last possible moment. And that's what Jesus does with Judas. So these are all prerequisites, as I told you, in order for us to be prepared to wash one another's feet to hold others to be accountable to us and to make ourselves accountable to others. And then we come to the fourth and in one sense, the most important prerequisite. Let me read verse three to you. Jesus knew that the father had put 
all things under his power and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Now that's very interesting. Only then, what do you see in verse 4? He got up from his meal, who took off his outer clothing, uh, and he took a towel that is a symbol of servanthood, ties it around his waist, and pouring water into a basin, he starts washing the disciples' feet. And tell you how the Bible itself becomes its own best commentary. Paul would say in verse 5, let in your relationship with one another have the same mindset. I'm using the latest NIV. Have the mindset as Christ Jesus. What was that mindset? Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being equal with God because he was secure in his equality with God. Come back to John 13 verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things into his hands and he was coming from God and was going back to God. You know, English translation, this NIV is very good. But unfortunately, the Hindi translation is unfortunately wrong. It says, Parmeshwar ke saman hote huye bhi, that bhi should not be there. Parmeshwar ke saman hone ke baje se, he was able to uh, come down to our level. That is the security that you have to enjoy. Even my Tamil translation is wrong. So well, I want you to carefully follow this. And therefore, his equality with God is a security that Jesus enjoys, which is why he is able to come and identify with us. You know, I want to tell you when I read this, I, my mind goes back to 97, end of August, beginning of September, where two famous women died within eight days of each other. You know whom I'm referring to. And if you are watching the funeral of uh, um, Diana, Princess of Wales on BBC, you would notice that the news of Mother Teresa's death comes into the studio. And the anchor, Richard McCormick, I still remember his name, for, I'll tell you why. He requests our High Commissioner in London, one of our most brilliant uh, intellectuals, Lal Mohan Singhvi, I think he's the father of Abhishek Singhvi, about whom you hear a lot these days. He calls him into the studios and he tells, asks him, don't you think what Mother Teresa did was in the spirit of all the great religions, blah, blah, blah. And Singhvi shakes his finger like this. And he says, no, she did what she did in the spirit of the true Christian missionary. Now, I'm, I'm making a uh, contrast between Mother Teresa and Princess Diana without casting any aspersion on the motives of Princess Diana because she did, did a lot for the poor, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. But when she died in that horrible car crash in Paris, she was wearing a ring on her finger worth 205,000 US dollars, which was given to her by her latest boyfriend. Dodi al -Fayed. But when her mother Teresa died, what was to her credit were only two cotton saris and one plastic bucket. Now what I'm trying to say, both of them did a lot for the poor, but you can do something for the poor in order to compensate for your inner emptiness. But you can also do something for the poor as an overflow of an inner fullness. That is a big difference. Outwardly, they are the same. That's why I will never judge the motive of many people not belonging to the Christian faith who did amazingly good work during this time when our Prime Minister announced the lockdown so suddenly that many of our migrant laborers were stranded without job, without work, without food. They were all going back. But I want to tell you, at the heart of true Christian work is the fullness of security in God, which overflows 
as an activity of service. See, that is why a person does not hold on to his position. A Christian, remember what I said in the first session, your identity does not come from the position that you hold. The position is to serve others. And when you serve others, you train others to take over from you. You know, in John chapter 14, we will not have time to go into that. Jesus has the courage to say to his disciples, he who believes in me, greater works than these shall he do. Where do you find leaders of that kind? Who would train leaders who would be greater than they themselves. See, that is the point. That comes only because of the security. It is not by attending hundreds of seminars on leadership building. In my understanding, if you soak yourself into passages of scripture like this, they become part of your personality. And you begin to see how you truly live in order to develop others. And you are not jealous when they seem to be doing much better than what you are doing. You know, that is something not only older people like me, but even younger people must begin to develop in their minds because that is going to be at the heart of it. Now let's move to John 14. Now John 14 is interesting because it has three uh, apostles, three disciples, making three requests to Jesus. And of course, we are all familiar with uh, Thomas. And of course, if you are a lawyer, you'll enjoy reading through this chapter. I'll tell you why. Because each one of these requests, first made by Thomas, then by Philip, then by Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, comes because of Jesus was leading them to ask those questions. So we are going to look at those questions in a sense to interpret these first three verses of John 13. That is, in order to develop these four requ uh, prerequisites, you need to develop certain attitudes which are given in these questions uh, that these disciples ask Jesus. Now, let me read how Jesus is asking, uh, uh, Jesus is leading Thomas to ask the first question. John 14. Uh, let me read verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. You know the way to the place where am I going. Surely, if you were Thomas, you would have asked the same question. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? You know, Jesus is amazing as a teacher, I'm saying, not only because of the questions he himself asked. Do you know that he asked some 173 questions in the Gospels? But he also carries on a conversation by which he makes you ask questions. At the end of our retreat, uh, George and company have given me half an hour for Q&A. I don't know how many of you are going to ask me questions. But the fact of the matter is asking questions is a very useful way of learning. But now let's uh, understand the question. When, uh, John, uh, when Thomas asked the question, we do not know where you are going. He thinks of where Jesus is going as a destination. How can we know the way? The way is a road that leads to that destination. Now, Jesus drops a bombshell. And in fact, uh, our normal translation, with which I don't have any serious quarrel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But the problem is, John's question is about the way. How can we know the way? So in one English translation, I think it is J.B. Phillips, or New English Bible, he, it gives the answer in a different way. I am the true and living way. Instead of three nouns, way, truth, life. Truth and life are made into adjectives. I am the true and living way. You are asking me about the way. Uh, I am not a road. I am a person. And where I am going? I am going to the Father not a destination. So the destination is a person, the weight is a person. Now, we, even in apologetics, I was with RZM for several years, 
We use this verse uh, to say that Jesus is the only way to, uh, to God the Father. That's not wrong. But please remember, Jesus is not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to his own disciples. So we must understand that there is a different level at which this question answer session should be understood. Jesus is actually saying, if you really want to discover yourself as a person, your personality, a kind of your discover your identity, you have to find that identity because of this huge identity of the Trinity, because it is through the Son coming to the Father, you will discover your identity. Let me give you a thought experiment. Um, we, um, this is uh, the Greeks, uh, defined the human person as, um, let me see how much time I have. Oh, don't have too much time. Anyway, uh, Jesus, uh, I mean, the Greeks defined the human personality as comprising the intellect, the capacity to think, emotion, the capacity to feel, and will, the capacity to decide and do. Imagine that you are the only person, no God, no universe, no CMC, no nothing. Will you be a person? You cannot be a person because uh, how, what use is your intellect if there's nothing to think about? What use is your uh, emotion if there is nothing to feel about? What use is your will if there is nothing to decide and do? So we are persons only because of other persons. You know, my wife and I were in South Africa in 2010. We were in the small town of Grahamstown but it's famous for uh, Rhodes University. I was doing a seminar for the university students, uh, black, white, colored. And when I was doing a seminar on the Trinity, this uh, young black man stood up and he said, sir, I belong to the Ikthosa tribe. We have a saying called Ubuntu. And those of you IT techies, you might have heard of Ubuntu operating system. Uh, leave alone the operating system. You go back to the original use of the word Ubuntu. It is a philosophy which he translated it into English. We are persons only because of other persons. Wow! You know what I told that young man? I said, Adam and Eve must be from your tribe because it's a Trinitarian God who makes us as human persons. So, and we are now, I think geneticists are more or less convinced that the first human pair came from Africa. So I would not be surprised if they came from this uh, tribe, which has this Ubuntu saying, and the Ubuntu operating system is an open system, they say. I don't know much about operating systems, but basically that's what it is. I am person because I'm open to you as persons. That's why I requested some of you at least to switch on your videos so that I can relate to you as I speak. And what Jesus is saying, you will really discover your personality as you relate to the Father through the Son. You will discover yourself as a person. You become secure in your personality. That is essentially the point. It's a kind of a way out of our insecurity. This morning, just before our uh, Sunday service started, uh, NDTV was showing how children sitting in front of computers, having only online classes, uh, what kind of psychological pressures they go through. I think uh, some of you are young enough to have children like that, and even older children going to university and all that. Uh, we are all having this problem. And I want to tell you, even when you are electronically connected, let us make it as interpersonal as possible. Now, the second disciple is Philip. Now, see what Jesus says to Philip. If you really know me, look at how he is leading Philip to make this request. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Naturally, Philip should ask, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. That's a bit of an insult to Jesus. He seems to say to Jesus, we have had enough of you. Let us now see what the father is like. 
Look at what Jesus says. And that is beautiful. We don't normally think about verse 9. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you, among you, such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You know, I want to tell you, this is a, an amazing statement. Jesus is God who has come to us at our human level. John himself says in first chapter, no one has seen God at any time. The only one who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. And so what Jesus is actually saying, you cannot see God because you are in your human dimensions. But because God made humans uh, in his image, I as a human being can come to you and to show you the Father at the level in which you can see him. Now, when you invite an engineer to speak to you, you are taking a risk. So I'm going to give you a kind of an engineering illustration. Uh, imagine a cube. A cube is a three-dimensioned object. Imagine that cube wanting to come into your monitor, if your smartphone or laptop, where you are following this retreat. What will that uh, cube will have to become? It will become a square, because the square is the image of a cube in two dimensions. Suppose in your monitor, there are other two dimension creatures. Can this the square tell those creatures, he who has seen me has seen the cube. Think about it for a moment, because we cannot have uh, uh, you all unmuting and speaking together. You know, a two-dimension creature living on your laptop monitor cannot see beyond two dimensions. The maximum of a cube that a two-dimension creature can see is a square. So this square, which you find on your uh, monitor, is actually a cube in three dimensions, but it has become a square in order to identify with you. But remember, it is still 100% cube in three dimensions and 100% square in two dimensions. And so when you look at Jesus, both God and man, don't think of humanity and divinity as a mixture, say a mixture of salt and sugar. Both are white powders. If I mix salt and sugar in the mixture, I cannot have 100% salt and 100% sugar. All of us remember our chemistry. It will be N% percent salt, 100 minus N% percent sugar. But this is not a mixture. It is a set coming into a subset. That is the maximum we can come. And that is how God in the person, in the human person of Jesus, comes to us at our level. You know what Jesus is trying to say? Related to John 13. You also, in the same way, you are going to relate to people who are very different from you, coming to their level, not condescending. Oh, I am so and so. Jesus did not, but be secure in your identity so that you can identify with others. You know, one of my, the joys of my 28 years of service in the government, I joined Bombay on 4th of June, 1965. And one of the things I decided that when the government shifted me from place A to place B, I would be willing to go as if God is moving me. Because in the central government, in the state government, uh, officers are always pulling wires in order to stay in the place where they built a house, they married a wife or whatever, they bought them a cow or whatever. They will never be mobile. They will never move around, never available. And so I said, Lord, I want to be available. So I started in Bombay, only two years in Chennai, then eight years in Delhi, uh, with a one and a half year gap in Ahmedabad, then from Delhi to Shillong, and Shillong to Calcutta, where I uh, um, handed over my papers on the 29th of October, 
Now, this exposure gave me the capacity to begin to identify with a very different kind of people with whom I had to work. And that's an amazing lesson that a Christian can take to the workplace because most of our problems of relationship is because we are not able to identify with people. I remember when I was posted in Shillong, I was in charge of all the seven northeastern states. I was in Imphal, capital of Manipur. I was having breakfast in my lodge. And there was a gentleman sitting in front of me, that same table, having breakfast. And he looked at me, stared at me. It was rather rude. And then he is asking me, are you a Manipuri Muslim? Now, I said, I am not a Manipuri and I am not a Muslim. But inwardly, I said to God, Lord, thank you because I look like a Manipuri Muslim. You know, the fact that you learn to identify with people who are different from you, I mean, that is the capacity to relate. All this EQ and all that we are talking about, emotional quotient, comes out of these chapters in the Bible. And that is why I tell you, we Christians are people who have to be very relational. Relational does not mean goody-goody. You have to be strict. Unfortunately, when I was in Shillong, I had to send three of my engineers to jail because they were corrupt. But one of my officers told me, sir, for us, LT means low tension because working with you was so easy. Because when we were meeting as a, as a committee, we were taking difficult decisions. You made the environment so relaxed that we did not even realize that we are taking such tough decisions. So I want to tell you, that is what God is training each one of us through the scriptures and through our workplaces, through our families. So I want you to take that because uh, I want to stop here because my time is up. Because in my last session, because uh, you got half an hour for feedback and Q&A, and I'm sure knowing Christian audiences, they will never ask questions. So I'm going to take more time in my last session. But here I'm going to stop here. Look, look at these uh, two things. First, what Jesus says to Thomas. It is not about uh, the only way of salvation. Not, that, not this context. Jesus is saying, for you to really develop a security of your identity, you have to rediscover your personality in relationship to the Father through the Son, through the Holy Spirit. That is what is going to give you that security because of which you will be willing and able to wash the feet of other fellow believers. Secondly, in the person of Jesus, God has become fully known to us at our level. We have a human being. You know, unfortunately, we Indian Christians do not name our sons as Jesus, which is a pity. If you go to countries where um, Spanish and Portuguese languages are spoken, you will see that the whole place is crawling with Jesuses. This is true in the Philippines, because Philippines was under uh, Spanish domination for 400 years. Everybody is a Jesus. But Jesus means Joshua. 25% of Jewish men and boys are Joshua. We have to understand and appreciate and thank God for this, that God has come to us at our level, in the human person of Jesus. And in that relationship, we begin to know something of the Father at our level. Well, the maximum of God that we can see is Jesus. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 3, that I may know him. I may know Jesus. Because in knowing more about Jesus, I come to know more about who God is. And in coming to know more what God is, I become secure in my identity. So that I am able to wash the feet of one another within the body of Christ. Uh, let me close in prayer and then I'll hand over uh, the mic to Pastor uh, Barinda. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for taking this human name of Jesus, taking that name of Jesus down to obedience, uh, not only as a human being, as a servant, but to the shameful death on the cross. But therefore, God, your Father, our Father, has raised you 
and has given you a name that at the very human name of you, not any Jesus, but this particular Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that you are Lord to the glory of God, your Father, our Father. We want to thank you that as you are teaching us through these amazing passages of Scripture, that you will open our hearts, qualify us, Lord, more and more uh, to develop the mindset which was in you. Amen. Over to you, Pastor Verinder. Forty-five. The church is one foundation, and we will be showing the uh, uh, this song or this hymn on the screen. Verse three onwards. Uh, Kevin, kindly sh kindly show you show the hymn. Just one more minute. Yes, three verse three onwards.
now we will have few more songs by our singing team We have come into his house. This is my prayer in the desert.
prayer and my hunger in me. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness of trial or pain. There is a faith proof of more than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is here. we'll sing is over the mountains and the sea.
Thank you, our singing team. Before we could enter into our third session, may I invite Rajiv to please come forward and uh, pray for the third session. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this beautiful time that you have given to us, Lord. We really thank you for this seminar lord jesus that you have given to us that we may be able to listen to your word and study deep into your word and may we bless O lord especially we pray for the third session O lord as we will be going into that and uh, you give each one of us and especially who are in this into this seminar lord you give them wisdom and understanding and let the holy spirit talks to each one of us O lord lord i pray for the speaker give him the heavenly wisdom and your knowledge and fill him with this your holy spirit O lord so that when he teaches lord the holy spirit guide him O lord you bless him lord that you are using him and he may be a blessing to so many people lord and we pray, pray for each and everyone who is into this and listening to your word O lord you bless each one of them lord the rest of the time lord i give into your mighty hand lord in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Over to you, sir. With myself. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's so nice that we can mute others in real conversation we cannot mute other people that is the difficulty <laughs> electronically i can just press the button my wife will be muted but that's not possible actually what we are studying here it's i i think there is a humorous side to this but we must understand uh, see, otherwise we will never be able to go through life uh, i i think um, we need to begin to see that uh, we have to listen to people sometimes when they say to you uh, things which you don't want to hear and uh, we, that is part of it now we'll come to the third uh, disciple judas and see how it connects uh, with each other i've been reading this so very many times and every time i read it i see a new dimension you know here it is judas but let's uh, look at um, or how Jesus is leading Judas to ask this question. Verse 21, uh, John 14, verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. That is, to those who love him. And then Judas is asking, 
uh, not Iscariot, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? I mean, this is a hugely important question. Let me give you a simple illustration. Jesus, after his resurrection, why did he not go to Pontius Pilate and say, hello, Pilate, you crucified me day before yesterday. Look, I'm back. He didn't go to Annas and Caiaphas and say, uh, I have uh, risen. I am the son of God. You know, this is very important. Sometimes we think it is a weakness of uh, this absence of Jesus directly appearing to all these people. Uh, no, 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 no. It is not simply proving his resurrection. It has to be much more than that. And that has to be done only through us. Now you can see the foundation of what we call the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, with Jesus saying to the disciples, you go and make disciples. And let's stay with John's gospel. Turn to chapter 20. After Jesus rises from the dead and he now appears to the disciples and what he says here, verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the father has sent me, I am sending you. That is the connection. You see, as the father sent Jesus, remember what Philip asked, show us the father that will be enough for us. And Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the father. Now, People are asking us, now this is a dangerous thing I'm asking, show us Jesus and we will uh, believe in him. And we should be able to say, you look at us, the Christian community. We are showing Jesus to you. This is the level at which Jesus is going to reveal himself to you. I mean, this is a very, very important thing. All that we study in sharing Christ, learning worldviews, there are lots of things which we have reduced to very technical exercises, very important. But at the heart of it is God will not reveal himself except through Jesus. And Jesus will not reveal himself except through his disciples. That is the conclusion. And that is so important. Now, where does this whole idea start? It starts in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, when he makes Adam and Eve in his image, and what does he say to us? He says to, what does he say to them? He says to them, you look after my creation. You work for human flourishing. That time the fall had not occurred. And God is saying, you are the ones whom we are, you are going to look after my creation. Now, you people are in Delhi, so I can give you a Delhi illustration. You know, this building in which our president lives is called Rashtrapati Bhavan. But it was built in the early part of the 20th century when the British were uh, shifting the capital from Calcutta to Delhi. And the person who lived there was the Viceroy. And do you know the name of this building was Vice Regal Lodge? The Viceroy lived there. Now, the viceroy means in place of the king, like vice chairman. So God is actually telling us, the first human pair, you are vice regents. You are kings and queens looking after my creation. Now, come to Psalm 115. It's good to follow this in the Bible. When you become more and more familiar with scripture, you will see some of these uh, thoughts. Uh, Psalm 115 Verse 16, Psalm 115, verse 16, the highest heaven, uh, heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the human race. You see, that is the point. God will not do anything in this world except through his human representatives. So there is a logic behind the Great Commission. God will not work in the world except through us. But now, coming back to John 14, I want to tell you uh, there are two reasons why this is. Uh, first of all, uh, here for the first time in these five chapters, John 13 to 17, the Holy Spirit is not mentioned in chapters 13 and 17. 
but he's mentioned in chapters 14 through 16. And in 14, look at verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. You know, those two prepositions are important. He lives with you, will be in you. That is before the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was with the believer, outside the person of the believer, not indwelling the believer, but outside the person of the believer. If you want one English word, he was extra personal, outside the person of the believer. That is why we see that the Holy Spirit comes upon King Saul, but when Saul disobeyed, the Holy Spirit leaves him and an evil spirit comes and troubles him. How does Peter, uh, how does David pray in Psalm 51? Do not take the Holy Spirit away from me. We don't pray that prayer. It's an Old Testament prayer because from the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. Now you come to John 14 verse 23 and it is, becomes clear. Verse 22 is where uh, Judas is asking this question. Why do you show yourself only to us and not to the world? And Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them. We means the father and the son. We will come to them and make our home with them. Now, how will the father and the son make our home with us, with CMC, the church, as well as individual believers in Christ uh, in uh, Centenary Methodist Church through the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son will make their home in us through the Spirit. Now, how was Jesus conceived in the womb of Mary? Through the Holy Spirit. He was baptized by the Holy Spirit as he began the ministry. And so it's the same Holy Spirit now working through the church in bringing Christ to the world. So that is the, uh, the whole thing, when you look at the big picture, it all makes sense. But what we normally do, and that's why I'm so grateful to CMC for giving me these three sessions so that I can take you through this journey and help you to see the big picture so that even our reading of the Bible undergoes a change. And please uh, remember, I'm going to stay on this, does not matter. I, uh, on 17 also is important, uh, but I let me stay here. Because we are reading the Bible only for therapeutic and utilitarian reasons. Therapeutic means what we can get out of God. Don't misunderstand me. Even the very breath that we breathe comes from God. But if we read the Bible only for that reason, we miss out all these passages. That is one of the reasons I strongly recommend to people do not underline your Bible. Because when you reread your Bible, your eye gravitates to what you have underlined and you pass over what you have not underlined. That is the Christian Passover. And there is no such festival. And all the verses I am reading to you today are all verses which you will not have underlined because you feel they are of no use to me. That is what I meant by utilitarian how to make use of God and how whatever is useful to me. No, no therapeutic reading of the Bible, no utilitarian reading of the Bible. See, that is why uh, I, I'm sure, I hope the young people are listening to me. Uh, young people, if you are listening to me, don't misunderstand this old man. What I'm saying is what we are singing as worship songs are actually praise and thanksgiving songs what God has done to us, very important. But that is not the only thing. The church is to worship God. Look at the two hymns we sang. Holy, 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 the church is one foundation. Not a single word about what God has done for me personally, but it's all about who God is and what God is doing in the church. Begin to think like that. And then write hymns, you young people, you should write it. Write some we songs, all I songs, I, 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 I. 
And we are from 40, 50 people, we are logging in here and we are singing I song. The interesting thing is when the worship leader, although our worship leader did not lead us in prayer, but whenever a worship leader leads in prayer, he or she will use our. But the songs are all mine. So I think we have to uh, make this change. Uh, Krupa is there, Jason is there. Uh, why don't you train your young people to do something like that? I become part of your family. So I'm so familiar with all of you. This is the thinking that has to come into our minds. Now we have taken selfishness into Christianity. All I, I, as if God does not exist for others. It's all I and God, you and God. We have nothing to do with each other. You know, I want you to capture this. This is important. And try reading these uh, five chapters together. Try reading it with your family. Try reading it with the young people. Uh, and begin to see what God is telling his first church of 11 disciples. One was a washout. And he's talking to the other 11. And I think we better take it seriously. So that is really what uh, this is all about. Now, let us quickly go to chapter 16, uh, even chapter 15. I'll make just one point. We all know chapter 15 is about us abiding in the vine. What for? To bring forth fruit. That's what Jesus says. But what is the fruit? I look at John 15, verse 17. That is the fruit. This is my command. Love one another. You see, the whole thing is about what the church has to be. How do we relate to one another? That is the fruit. That is the fruit of the spirit that Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter 5. So what we are seeing here is the church through the Holy Spirit, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, is first of all showing love among ourselves. And then from us, the church, love goes out into the watching world. I know, for example, that Brother George Mani, for example, is working among pastors and all in many different parts of the country. You know, what we have to tell them, that love in the church should precede love of the church. Just as love in God precedes the love of God, love in the church precedes the love of the church. See, that is how we begin to understand this. Now, there is another Methodist church in Singapore. It's called Christ Community Methodist Church. I did a seminar for them on the Trinity. And then they asked me to write an article for the church, which they put up on their website. Uh, it is a very interesting article. I had never written an article like that. Uh, they said, uh, we want an article from you on the work of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. Because we know the work of the Holy Spirit in the church, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and we read the Acts of the Apostles, and we see a number of places where the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And then uh, I wrote an article, but I'm just going to mention one point to you. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. And this will lead us to John chapter 17. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 8. Sorry, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit is one of pouring God's love into our hearts. But remember, how does the Father and the Son constitute one divine being? It is through the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit of God who pours the love of the Father into the Son and vice versa. And that is why we do not believe in three gods. We believe in three persons constituting one divine being. That becomes very important. Now let's turn to John 17. And if there is some time or in response to Maybe a question or two. We will come to John 16. But now we'll go to John 17 with that very famous prayer. And we are going to look, in, look at that. 
this whole thing, I would say that this chapter is probably the most sacred chapter in the Bible because we are listening to a conversation within the triune God. And what is Jesus praying here? I'm reading from verses 20 to 24. My prayer is not for them alone, not, not just for these 11 disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Uh, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. You know, the word glory that John uses when God's presence came upon the tent that uh, Mo Moses had built, no one could even enter. When uh, Solomon uh, dedicates the temple, First Kings chapter 8, the whole temple is filled with the glory of God. But here, in these five chapters, we are seeing the word glory used in a very different way. The glory is the unity of the body of Christ, reflecting the unity of the Trinity. That is why the church as the image of the Trinity is also a good title. So what we are seeing here, and that's what Jesus is praying, that they may be one even as we are one. Now we have a grammar problem with English and Hindi. Turn with me quickly, or you can even, uh, don't have to turn, it's a very short verse, John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. Main aur pita ek hain. That is Hindi. Now, unfortunately, in English uh, one and Hindi one, you cannot distinguish between masculine, feminine, and neuter genders. But I want to tell you that English, which has three genders, uh, sorry, Greek, which has three genders, German, which has three genders, have three different words for one masculine, one man, one woman, and one thing, masculine, feminine, and neuter. Now I'll tell you, my language is Tamil. Those of you who speak uh, three Southern Indian languages, Tamil, uh, Malayalam, and uh, Kannada. Uh, Telugu is slightly different. But in these three languages, we have very clearly three different words for masculine, feminine, and neuter. In Kannada, for example, nanu uh, tandeyu ondagi deve, ondu, means one neuter. In Tamil, nanum pidavum ondrayirkirom, one neuter. Malayalam, Nyanum Pidavum Unnahun. Now, these three Southern Indian languages have very clear words for one masculine, one feminine, one neuter. Why is the neuter gender important? Both in John 10 30 as well as in John 17. I'll give you a simple example. Now, you have seen me, of course, in February. You are seeing me now. Uh, I am losing my hair. Uh, I don't comb my hair. I only arrange them because uh, there is very little to comb. Suppose you see me after five years, if God gives me a longer life and I've lost the rest of my hair. And if you ask me, are you the guy who came and did this uh, seminar, online seminar for us uh, in September, if I were to speak in Greek or in uh, German or in the three Southern languages, I would say, I and the person who came five years ago are one, and I would use the masculine gender. That means we are one and the same person. 
But uh, uh, John does not want us to misunderstand that. The father and the son are not one and the same person, but they belong to the one and the same substance. That is why those of us, I don't know, uh, in CMC, do you ever recite the Nicene Creed? Can anyone unmute or tell me? Pastor Varinda, uh, do you uh, say the Nicene Creed? Do you? I think Pastor Barinder has Very come. rare. So, uh, very rare, you? not much. Most of the not time. Very rare. Same, same in our church also. Uh, in our old time Methodist also. Although once when. Pa Pardon? Requested him because I was doing a seminar on the Trinity. Yes. Uh, so I asked him to, that Sunday, he uh, put it up on the overhead, the okay. Nicene Creed. You know, the Nicene Creed, the second paragraph is very important. I believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, God from God, light from light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. You know, the word substance, unfortunate word. And that is why in more recent translation, uh, they say being of, of one being with the father. That means the father and the son are not one and the same person, but they belong to the same divine being. And that is why uh, the neuter gender is used, uh, belonging. So you know, now when we come to John 17, and when Jesus is praying here, that they may be one even as we are one. That is verse 21 in the English Bible. That one is also in the neuter gender. Uh, but because we are many men and women here uh, in the seminar, but we are one body, the church, which is why the best illustration of the uh, Trinity is the church. Uh, because we are many men and women, but we constitute one body, which is the church. Which is why uh, when we sang that um, hymn, that last hymn, the church is one foundation, uh, God is trying to show to the world through the church, through CMC, through the families of CMC, not necessarily through your Sunday worship service, but your weekday Bible study groups. Once in a while, please invite people from other faiths to join you and you can have a slightly different kind of a Bible study. When we were in Singapore, my wife, we were worshipping in a Methodist church there also. But uh, we were, uh, so my wife was leading a Bible study at home for ladies. And once in a while, a Hindu lady would drop by. You know what impressed her? She told my wife, I find it amazing that you can pray with such concern for people whom you have never met. Because a Hindu's understanding of prayer is only to get something for himself, herself, maybe for the family, but not for somebody whom you have never seen. You see where we connect with people? That's exactly what Jesus is praying. People will know, people will know that I live in you when they see my people. They will know that you are concerned with, about others whom you may not have even seen. I know that uh, your church is uh, supporting missionaries, working in different places, and you're praying for them. Many of them may not even have seen them. But that is the point. The world begins to understand this. These days in the print online paper, there are all kinds of uh, articles whether Christianity has failed or not failed. I, I don't worry too much about these articles. I only say, Lord, where we have failed, you tell us, so that we can show to the world that this is how we are going to express our concern, even for people who do not belong to the Christian family, and that others see, other people who have not yet come to faith in Christ, know that we are all concerned for them. And that will show to the world that the Father and the Son and the Father, look at how Jesus puts it. It's a very complicated sentence. I'm reading verse 7. 21 uh, onwards. 
Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. That is the point that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, it is because through that indwelling, not only our individual indwelling, the Lord indwelling in us and we dwelling in him, we the branches abiding in the vine and the vine giving its sap into the branches. But the fact is we are reflecting something about the truth of the Trinity. You see, the doctrine of the Trinity cannot be proved in that sense. But the demonstration of the Trinity is unity in the church. And I want to tell you, unity is not uniformity. That is very important. And I'm very happy in an English speaking congregation, you always have a variety of languages. And that's a very beautiful thing. That is why I felt free to quote from the languages that I'm quite familiar with. So uh, the whole point of it is, in this unity, which is part of the church, and one of the things that thrilled me very much was, um, what was it? It was a worship song to Jesus, sung in so many Indian languages. Did you see that uh, video? It went viral all over the place. Let our Hindu and Muslim friends see that. Our, uh, world because Jesus belongs to the whole world and that's exactly yeah uh, this uh, this is what God wants to see in us that through us the world will begin to see this wonderful kind of unity and that is why, uh, you know, that last stanza, uh, the world will know, uh, and we have sweet communion with God the three in one. Samuel Stone's uh, brilliant hymn on the Trinity and the church. So what we are seeing here is that we have a union with one another. So let me tell you, first of all, unity is not uniformity. U uh, unity is unity in diversity. Now, all our leaders say, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, India is one. But the theological foundation for that is only the Christian faith. Only the doctrine of a triune God can be the basis by which this nation will become one. And please pray like that. And that is what God is going to be doing uh, in our lifetime, possibly may not be in our lifetime, but uh, no problem in starting to pray like that. Because that is exactly uh, Jesus' prayer for us. Secondly, unity is not uni unanimity. Now, let me give you a simple illustration. I'm sure you had a committee meeting online or WhatsApp or whatever uh, to have this uh, seminar and to have me as the resource person. Now, I don't know whether there were alternatives. Uh, let's assume that you had to choose between two people. And three people said uh, we should have LT. And four people said, let us have somebody else. And then you had discussion. And then somehow the four people decided, although we are the majority, we will go by what the three people say. And let us have LT in our seminar. Now, this is interesting. This is unity. It is not by election where even people who are in the majority listen to the discussion from the other side and decide to submit their opinion to the others. And if something goes wrong with that decision, you don't say, I told you so. You know, that is one of the interesting things in our <laughs> committee meetings. After all, you have to decide about some somebody in the committee says, and if I did not agree with the committee's decision, and if something goes wrong, I say, I told you so. No, no, no. I subscribe to that decision. Whether come hell or heavy weather, I'm going to stand by this decision. That is unity. Unity is an act of the will. It is not an activity of the emotion. It is you decide to agree with your brother, your sister, although you may have your own uh, arguments 
And please remember that these differences are not about fundamentals. These are not about the Trinity. There is no disagreement about the Trinity. There is no disagreement that Jesus is both God and man. There is no disagreement that the salvation God has given to us is uniquely only through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. No, you see, I, let me tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, churches have split on the simple question of where to have a program, uh, whether you have to have in place A or place B, churches have split. And that is very unfortunate. And that is exactly the reason why I am putting unity as higher than uniformity, higher than unanimity, where you decide to agree with someone, although you may have your own reasons for not agreeing, you put those reasons in subordination to your decision to agree. And that is important. That is the prayer that Jesus is praying for. Now, I want to tell you, for that, you need to have a certain attitude. So I'm going to leave chapter 17 for a moment, and I'm going to take you back in my experience. I will come back to some of these chapters, by the way. 1969, I was posted in Nagpur. That's before we got married. I was assistant executive engineer looking after the eastern half of Nagpur and one project in Raipur. Raipur is today in, Madhya, in Chhattisgarh. Those days it was called Madhya Pradesh. And so I was on an overnight journey, a long train journey from Akola in central Maharashtra. Nagpur was my headquarters, but I started west of Nagpur, traveling through Nagpur overnight journey. And in Nagpur, my assistant from the office came with some papers for me to sign. And when I got up the next morning, the train had entered Madhya Pradesh. It was a beautiful morning. And so I stood at the door of my compartment and I was singing praises to God. Now, first class compartments those days were not uh, air conditioned and my cabin was just next to the door. When I came back to my seat, I realized that my fellow passenger, who was a Hindu gentleman, was listening to me. And he asked me, what were you doing just now? And I, of course, uh, I said, I was worshiping God. Do you know what he said? Mind blowing. He said, your God must be an utterly selfish God. He wants all of you to worship him. I was speechless. If I came across that gentleman today, I would give him a one hour lecture on the Trinity. I'll tell you why. Uh, because we are saying that we are studying church as the image of the Trinity. These passages, if you can, please turn with me, all from John's Gospel. Because let me frankly tell you, John tells us more about the Trinity than anybody else. And in my imagination, I read the Bible in a very imaginative, imaginative way. Uh, John was young enough not to be embarrassed to lean on the breast of Jesus and to hear the heartbeat of the triune God. Poor Dan Brown mistook John for Mary Magdalene and wrote the Da Vinci Code and made a few billion dollars for himself. God bless him. But it was not Mary Magdalene who was leaning on the breast of Jesus. It was John. Okay, let's turn to John 5. John 5, I'm reading from verses 19. 19 to 23. No, 20 to 23. For the Father loves the Son. Now, all these verses which I'm going to read are about relationships within the Trinity. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead, and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son as the, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Now these verses tell you about the Father's attitude to the Son in the Trinity. Now look at verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Truly, truly, I tell you, 
the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. This verse tells you the, uh, gives you the attitude of the son to the father. Now turn to John 16 and read verses 13 and 14. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. It is the spirit's attitude to the son. What is this common attitude, which is the answer to the statement made by my fellow passenger on the Bombay Howrah Express? Think about it. What does the father do? The first person of the Trinity, he delegates everything to the son. He wants uh, everyone to honor the son as they honor the father. Even the judgment he has given to the son, even our Muslim friends believe that Allah will judge the world through Isa al-Masih. So the father entrusts all judgment to the son. But look at the attitude of the son in verse 19. The son will do nothing by himself. The son will not say to himself, now that the father has given to me everything, I'll go and do my own thing. He will do only what he sees the father doing. What does the spirit do? The spirit will not speak of himself. He'll take from Jesus and show it to us. All that we are learning today is what the spirit of God is teaching us. He will not uh, um, seek his own glory. He will bring glory to Jesus. What is this? This is selflessness at the highest level in the Trinity. Now you begin to see, even Jesus, let me say this very reverently, even Jesus giving up himself on the cross for us is an overflow of his selflessness within the Trinity. Remember what I said in the first session, Love in God precedes the love of God. You can say selflessness in God precedes the selflessness of God. That is what it is. See, which is why pride is such an ugly sin in the life of the Christian. Because, see, pride is, uh, uh, humility is one of those most evasive human qualities. Because the moment I think I am humble, I have ceased to be humble. <laughs> that is the problem with humility. Humility is an entirely unself-conscious quality. You know, when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was shining that he did not know that his face was shining. I want to tell you, my dear brothers and sisters of CMC, that as you reflect on what has gone on today, May God make us unselfconsciously reflecting his character. You know, when we were uh, small boys, every time we came back from school every day, we would ask our mothers, have I grown taller? We used to draw a scale on the wall those days and we used to measure ourselves. You know, growth is unselfconscious. And Christian character is unselfconscious. Humility is unselfconscious. Even the God of the one whom we worship. Do you begin to see? You know the doctrine of the Trinity. I am paraphrasing C.S. Lewis here. Uh, Trinity is like the sun. You cannot see the sun directly because it is so bright. But because of the sun, you can see everything else. Everything falls into place. Look at a symphony. Many instruments, but one melody. Look at a painting. Many colors, but one theme, unity and diversity. The world around you is full of unity and diversity. It can have been created only by a God in whose being there is both unity and diversity. University is a Christian term uh, devised to say under the unifying framework of God, you can study a diversity of disciplines. You know, the theme verse 
on Oxford University main entrance. Psalm 27 verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In his light, we see light, even academically, even in our studies. I mean, this is applicable right across the board to the whole of human existence. Okay, over to you, Pastor. Uh, 